Today, we have Professor Chris Cruz, uh, who teaches in the International Studies and Writing Program here at Denison. And previously, he taught at TSU at Chico and uh, in GVSU in Michigan. And his areas of research include social movements, uh, indigenous rights, environmental justice, religious nationalism, and extremist politics. Uh, here, his PhD in politics, the New School for Social Research in New York, where I actually met him for the first time. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Chris Cruz. How are you doing this evening? Folks hear me okay in the back? So, um, thank you, Pedro, for the introduction. Uh, as you may know from the poster, tonight's topic is gonna be about, uh, is the United States potentially heading to a civil war? Um, what would that mean? How would we know? Why would it matter? And um, the context around that. So just a, a kind of a quick note, I'm sort of coming to this as a fairly new research area. I've been looking for many years at social movements and increasingly at extremist politics within social movements, but haven't really been looking at civil war. So thinking about the far end of social movements coming from extremist politics into civil war is sort of new. So this is uh, definitely a work in progress. So take everything I say with a handful of salt, if you will. So right, January 6, 2001, Capitol insurrection in Washington, DC as uh, one moment that probably comes to mind when people think about heightened political tension in the United States. So here's what I'm gonna to try to do tonight. Talk a little bit about what do we mean when we talk about a civil war? How do we study civil wars? Particularly, how some of the popular literature as well as the academic literature looking at this topic? Look a little bit at the role of ideology in civil wars and particularly thinking about how things like partisan divides, conspiracy theories, um, distrust in government and violence play into those factors. And then finally, if the United States could be heading towards a potential civil war, what might be some of the drivers that we want to pay attention to in that process? So first, what is a civil war? Right. So scholars point to a number of different things, right? Usually it's violence within an individual country. Usually you have some kind of armed groups involved. This could be right state actors, this could be non-state actors, it could be a mix of those. The goal usually is to seize power, could be right to seize central government, or it could be in a region. So think about breakaway regions within countries. Um, Eastern Ukraine, right, as we've seen with Donetsk and Crimea and other areas, right? The goal usually is to change the form of government, right? Either because you want to put something else in place or you're not happy with what's there currently. And usually there's some kind of, right, an ethnic or religious or economic or political ideology that's informing right, the underlying roots of that civil war. Um, scholars usually say to define something as a civil war, right? this is Dave, what we were talking about earlier today, Right. Usually you need to have at least a thousand people that are killed in order for scholars to say this qualifies as a civil war as opposed to just kind of localized violence. And we know from research has been somewhere between about 125 to 150 civil wars since the end of World War II. Um, and right now around the world, depending on sort of which measures you use, there's approximately 20 or 30 different armed conflicts going on today. So for example, a Center for Foreign Relations, CFR, has pinpointed right these different yellow dots as places where we've had various civil conflicts going on. Some of them open armed conflicts, um, others not necessarily open civil wars, but you've got political instability and political fighting going on. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these um, in just a minute. So in the last uh, two years or so, there's been a couple of books that have come out specifically thinking about interconnections of political violence, civil war, and growing sort of partisan politics. So Barbara Walters, How Civil Wars Start, which some of my students recognize. This is the book we're reading right now in the National Studies 100 class. Um, Bradley Anishi's book, Preparing for War, which specifically looking at sort of the role of white Christian nationalism in a sort of larger historical context and its contribution to um, increasing violence today. And then um, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zablatt's book, The Tyranny of the Minorities, which just came out. You may know these two authors they wrote on how democracies die just a few years earlier, which was also a um, popular New York Times bestseller. And each of these books tries to help us think about growing political violence, some in the United States, some globally. Um, Dr. Walter takes a much more kind of global lens, thinking about right, how Yugoslavia, 
the transitional politics in Iraq after the US invasion, hit the collapse of Syria, um, different ways to think about these globally. So these are just a, kind of a couple examples just in the last two years of uh, major books that have been written about these issues and have all received wide um, coverage and publicity. But we're also seeing other books that may not necessarily come from a scholarly lens, but have also generated a lot of interest. So Jeff Charlotte's book, The Undertow, um, Stephen Marsh, who's a Canadian um, writer, thinking about what civil war looks like from the Canadian perspective, looking down from the North um, here to the United States. And then uh, Stephen Phillips, How We Win the Civil War, focused on multiracial democracy and arguments about part of the tension right now that's playing out in the United States around civil conflicts is about are we moving towards a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, or are we moving away from that? And could that be a potential political fault line? And each of these basically involves journalists in some way or another traveling around the country, talking to people, um, trying to get a sense of what do people on the ground in different communities feel like is happening right now in the United States? What's tearing people apart? What's happening in church congregations? What's happening right, in business conversations? What's happening at the local diner and the local coffee shops? And what can we sort of gather both from past histories and kind of contemporary politics today? So for folks that are kind of interested in this topic more generally, um, right, these three kind of more popular books and these three more sort of academic leaning books are both uh, potential places to kind of dig into these ideas some more. So part of what I want to talk about today comes from some of the work of Dr. Walter and others thinking about specific context of US democratic politics and this concept of anocracy. So for my students that heard part of this lecture this morning, bear with me here. So this work came out of uh, Professor Ted Gurr in the 1970s. And this was basically an attempt by a political scientists to figure out how do we come up with measures to understand the kind of state of political unrest instability within a country. And he came up with this concept that now um, is one of a couple of different ones that scholars and researchers are using to try to measure sort of the political and the social and the economic factors and how they kind of fit together to help us think about the fragility or stability of the state. Um, one of the things that this has led to is work with the Polity Project, which came out of the Center for Systemic Peace, um, which Dr. Gurr was uh, helped involved with. And they basically tried to create a 21 point scale that combines all these different factors, political factors, cultural factors, economic factors, to get a sense of where is the country in terms of its internal political stability, possibility of conflicts, and then put those into a range. So on one hand, you have plus 10, those are strong, robust democracies, right? free, fair, open election, checks on political power, uh, legislative, judicial executive balance or whatever kind of makeup, right? Depending on what form of, of governance or republic you have there on one side. And on the other extreme, you have the anocracies at minus 10, right? So this is the kind of classic political dictatorships, think something like North Korea, for example, where there's no open fair elections, free press, checks on sort of political rule. And then in the center between those from plus five to minus five, you have the term anocracy. And this is kind of a fancy way to say, it's not a democracy, it's not an autocracy, it's somewhere in between, right? So other people would call these hybrid or transitional regimes, faux democracies, partial democracies, right? illiberal democracies, some um, scholars refer to them. So you have some aspects of democracy, but not necessarily a full robust one. And in particular, what we're interested in is this minus five to plus five range when countries move from democracy towards that zero point or from the minus 10 towards the zero point, that kind of five point scale on either side, plus or minus five, is that zone where a country is more likely to move into a state of civil war. And as I'll talk about in a second, the zero plus one, zero minus one is kind of the peak danger zone for when a civil war is likely to occur. Why does this matter? So the US using these measures, for a long time, we were firmly at the plus 10. Starting in 2016, we were moved down by the Polity Project Index from plus 10 to plus eight. In 2019, we were moved down to plus seven. And then in 2021, we were moved down to plus five. So on this scale, the United States has now moved into the range of anocracy, right? So we're at the beginning of a danger zone for scholars who look at these political instability indexes and say, Right. That transition from plus 10 to plus 5 
and everything that that signifies, distrust in elections, attempts to overthrow, right, the certification of electors, gerrymandering politics, increasing political partisan divides, all those things are the kind of precursors that we want to pay attention to. So just to kind of give you a little bit of context here. So again, that anocracy democracy scale up there on the top left. So this is looking at all the different countries they looked at from 1955 to 2018. And what you see again, right, is this anocracy range in the zero plus one, zero minus one. That's when majority of civil wars have broken out when a country's moved in that specific plus one or minus one range. But as you can see, Right. As soon as you get into the plus five or the minus five, that peak right, keeps going up. So the possibility um, of instability grows. And as we think about right, those measures on a bigger historical trend on that chart on the right, right, what we see in general, right, blue, that blue line is democracy. So from the beginning of the 1800s up, right, a big spike here. What happened in 1990? Anything important at a global level? Where's my students out there? 1990, what happened in the world? Yes, but also what else? We think about democracy. Taylor Swift was born the year before. <laughs> Which actually may be a more important marker than you realize. <laughs> right. 1989, 1990. Yes. Berlin Wall. Yeah, right. We get the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, and the opening up of right, Eastern European countries, the Baltic countries, and this period of political transition, right? So suddenly, Huge spike in democracy is going up in blue, a big drop in autocracy is going down in red. But right, what comes out of that big change is also a lot of these new anocracies here. The countries that are moving either from full authoritarian politics towards democracy, or they're sliding away from democracy towards more sort of authoritarian politics. Right? Hold those thoughts for one second, we'll come back to them. So keep these ideas in mind, right? So that polity project is one way that scholars try to think about this. Freedom House is another uh, sort of place scholars look to for data when they're trying to measure these kind of changes. And every year, Freedom House puts out a report that looks at freedom in the world. Right? That's what they call their reports. And what we've seen is that in the last couple of years, the democratic institutions that underlie politics in the United States are under increasing pressure. We're seeing growing right, roles of conspiratorial politics, election denial, gerrymandering affecting right people's political representation of power and more dark money thanks to things like citizens united shaping right, the electoral process and so the united states went from a score of 89 out of 100 in 2017 to right after the 2016 elections to today at 83 right so we've seen a six point drop just in the last couple of years and to give you kind of a comparison our neighbor to the north canada is at 98 so we've got Canada at a freedom index of 98 and the United States dropping from 89 to 83, just between 2017 and 2023, right? And these are measuring right, a whole range of different things, but especially political rights and civil liberties. So if we think about where, where do we kind of know some of this information from? There's a really good joke about a CI analyst and an academic that walk into a bar if I knew how the punchline ended, I would tell you, I don't. But imagine that setup scenario <laughs> taking place in 1994. And the outcome of that, right, the punchline, if you will, is the Political Instability Task Force. So basically, the CIA said, it'd be really great if we could predict the outbreak of a civil war or a political collapse in the future. That would make our job a heck of a lot easier. And so they pulled together a bunch of their best data analysts and a bunch of experts on civil wars and political conflicts, and they threw them all together into a conference room in Virginia or somewhere on the East Coast. The real origin of location may be undisclosable. It is the CIA, after all. And they said, okay, help us figure out what might happen, where, and when. And so all these experts said, well, we've got all these different measures, at least 38 different measures that we can use to try to understand political conflict. But two of them stood out as predictive for when a civil war was likely to take place out of all these different measures that they found. And those were the anocracy score of a country and the role of factionalization within the politics within that country. Right, so countries that are moving into that minus five plus five range like the US has just moved are more likely 
than countries on either end. So more democratic or more authoritarian, right? Both more stable for different reasons, but still both equally stable. And if you get into that minus one plus one range, then the likelihood is significantly higher, right? That's the sort of danger zone, if you will. Equally important, right, with where you are in that measure is the centrality and the function of factions within the country, right? So countries that have large factions where you have to pick, right, I'm either with them or I'm with them. Think about, right, the Hutu and the Tutsis and other conflicts, right, where ethnic identity, religious identity, Sunni and Shia in the Iraq example after right, the U.S. invasion. And we can think about lots of other, right, examples. That factionalization with two big parties and importantly, right, two big parties that feel like their existential identity is a threat and that identity is based in a kind of racial identity or an ethnic identity or religious identity. So, right, it's, it's literally who I am is that threat and I'm gonna fight to protect and defend it, right? When you get those two factors together, the factionalism, particularly around parties that are no longer based on left and right, but my ethno-religious identity, the likelihood is extremely high. And so why does that matter? So we know ideologies, those of you that study right, politics are familiar with ideologies. We look at it in a lot of different ways. It, ideologies tell us who we are. They help us think about what we should believe, right? The, the coding the party line, if you will. Uh, but they also suggest how we should act. Right, based on our political convictions and our party politics, our platform, if you will. So if we think about in the United States context, right, what I call sort of civil war adjacent ideology, right? We're not in an active state of civil war in the United States, but if we wanna think about what might be some of the things to pay attention to, right? We've got a significant rise in the last decade of anti-government groups. So the 3% militias, Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, Boogaloo Boys, Patriot Front, right? All of these different groups that advocate both anti-government politics, some of them openly secessionists or insurrectionists, and they're all advocating and organizing along militia lines, right? Weapons training, munitions training in some cases, right? We also have seen a significant rise in conspiracy theories linking these groups to broader political trends, right? So think about the explosion of QAnon seemingly out of nowhere in the last five or six years, from 2016 forward in particular, right, the whole idea that the 2020 20 election right, was stolen, the Stop the Steal movement, and this growing kind of discourse of the deep state, right, conspiratorial politics. And then finally, the rise of this kind of ethno-religious political identities, probably most clearly in the concept that scholars have sort of described as white Christian nationalism, right, where your racial identity, your religious identity, and your political identity are starting to be fused into this kind of conglomeration. So we think about, well, what are the factors that are shaping and driving some of these forces, right? The US, if we look across the board, has one of the most heavily armed populations in the world, even compared to places that have active military conflicts going on. Right? Growing partisan divide and factionalism, both within parties and across the country. Right? Growing distrust in government itself and increasing, um, support for democracy in some sectors, but increasing questioning of democracy in others, right? Growing belief in conspiracy theories, and finally, growing acceptance of political violence as a legitimate means to either keep your party in power, get your party in power, or right, defend certain political gains. But there's a few things in the US context that are sort of mediating or maybe you know pumping the brakes, so to speak. Right? We're not gonna see a repeat, pretty much all the scholars that I'm familiar with and have read and looked at said, we're not gonna see another 1861 civil war. It just, things are too different in the United States today to have a repeat of that kind of specific dynamic. Most people, there's a couple of retired military generals who are a little bit less sanguine about this, but most people say a military coup is unlikely in the United States. Um, the various branches of the armed forces and the reserves are too attached to the idea of civilian rule to support a military coup, at least in the current political climate. And finally, the chances of a cross-border insurgency of the kind we're starting to see in more places around the world is probably fairly unlikely. Canadian militias or the government of Canada starting a civil war on the northern borders, probably really, really low 
Mexico, same thing, right? Some people might point to drug cartels, but even there, um, the drug cartels versus the US military, I know where I'm gonna put my money on those bets. So those are some factors that maybe slow some of that fear down for people. Right? But why this matters, right? So think about a, a photo like this. Right? If you didn't have any other context, you might think, right, that this is a group of maybe law enforcement, perhaps there's just been a school shooting, or perhaps there's a hostage situation, or perhaps they're preparing for some kind of a, a political uh, mobilization. Uh, but no, this is Blue Blue Boys at a Second Amendment gun rally right, in Virginia. Right? Full tactical gear, riot helmets, right? Most of them carrying AR-15s or some kind of assault rifles. Right? Most of them wearing body armor, right? You could dump them into a conflict zone anywhere and they would look like armed combatants, right? But this is the streets of Virginia a year or two ago. And this kind of scene is becoming increasingly common in the United States. Right? So just to kind of put this in some context, right? If we look from 1972 to 2022, we've seen kind of up and down in terms of how many people are owning guns in the United States. But what we see is that in moments of political crisis for certain parts of the country, those increase or decrease significantly, right? So there was this increase going up in the late 1980s. And we had the school shooting in January 1989, the Cleveland School Massacre, some of you may remember that, Stockton, California. And then shortly after that, the national debates about the assault gun ban started. And we saw kind of a dramatic plummet in gun ownership. Went up, went down after the election of Barack Obama in 2009, right? We saw a big spike up again in people going out and buying guns. Went up, went down, went up, went down. Most recently, right, it's gone up in response to 2020, both the Black Lives Matter protests in the summer and the COVID lockdowns, right? An increasing kind of pushback against this deep state government who's coming to, right, to take away our freedoms and our liberties. Um, and that number has continued to go up since 2022. So 30% of U.S. adults own a gun. So it's one in three right, in this room as of this current year. And the average person owns five guns, right? possibly a combination right, of those five guns, rifles, shotguns, pistols, assault rifles. We've jumped from 400 million guns to 466 million guns just in the last couple of years. And right, that distribution of guns is spread out fairly evenly, shotguns, handguns, and AR-15s. Right. So 30% of people that have rifles or assault rifles, the rest are your typical right, 30 out six, I'm gonna go hunt a deer or something like that. Right. The kind of thing you'll see around here in the back of pickup trucks in an early kind of era. Not so much AR-15, right? that's more of a new emergence. But it's also important to think about where are these guns, right? So over a million of those are in Texas alone, right? Texas, if there was gonna be an insurrection, Texas is either where you'd want to stay away from or where you'd want to be, depending on where you fall off right, in the armed conflict. Um, but importantly, right, Ohio is in this top 10 list, right? So we're part of this broader kind of political demographic in terms of who has guns. And it, it crosses the partisan divide too. This is something important to keep in mind. Although Republicans tend to be more likely to have guns or live in a house with guns, um, Democrats, right, still 20% of Democrats own a gun, 31% live with someone who owns a gun. Right? And a lot of these independents, it's hard to say, some of them probably fall Democrat, some probably fall Republican. So those numbers are probably higher if you put the independents into, are they leaning left or are they leaning right? Okay, so that's the violence piece of it. What about how people feel about their government themselves? Right? Well, on the left there, happiness, are people happy with Congress? Not so much. And that's been going down, right? So disapproval was at 69% back in September 2021, and it's risen up now to 82% as of just, I guess, a month and a half ago in September. Right? So greater distrust of government and how particularly Congress is handling and doing its job, right? and also an increasingly unfavorable view of the political parties themselves. 30% right? of Democrats or Republicans, doesn't matter, all are, agree that they have an unfavorable view right, of how partisan politics and particularly the parties themselves. Right? So it doesn't matter if you identify as a Democrat or Republican, you may still be unhappy with what your party is doing. Right? But there's still a diehard core, right? 18% of Democrats, 16 Republicans who are very favorable, very strong, right? These are the kind of diehard partisans. 
right? That doesn't matter, do or die, right? I believe red or I believe blue. But that has deeper political implications, right? Because it's also leading to more partisan polarization around the actual parties themselves. So not only are we moving further apart in how we feel about the parties, but the actual parties and how they see each other is increasingly moving further and further away. Right? So in 1994, that unfavorable view, it's 17% for Republicans, 16% for Democrats. But by the time we get to 2017, right, both of those have jumped to nearly 44, 45%. So right, those, the idea that you can't work with a Democrat, you can't work with a Republican, right? you can't cross the aisle that kind of bipartisan politics. And it, importantly, right, the confidence that those two parties can actually work together in Congress is also grown. Right? So people are being polarized within the parties, the parties are being polarized against each other, and people feel like, well, they can't accomplish anything in Congress. Right? We saw this um, playing out very clearly with the failed vote over and over to get a new Speaker of the House, right, after Kevin McCarthy was given the boot recently. And so what these trends are suggesting is, right, one in four of you in here thinks that, well, maybe we should have a national divorce. Right? Maybe it's time to break up the union, right, to end the experiment in the republic. And that number is, you know, not insignificant. 23% of you know, all the people responding said, yeah, maybe we should. Now, importantly, 62% said no, right? But the fact that 20% of Americans, or at least, you know, this representative sample of voters as part of a bigger population, right, think that maybe we should do that, right? Not an insignificant number. And we're also seeing, right, people that are identifying more as a conservative Republican versus a moderate or liberal Republican, if that number is growing, and the same thing right, with Democrats. So even within those party identities, people are pushing more to the edges of where they identify as a more liberal Democrat, more conservative Republican. And that divide right, is playing out in a lot of different ways. Part of what's driving that right, political and partisan divide is right, the media landscape and the role of conspiracy theories, particularly in people's perceptions of, can we trust the government? Is the government accountable? Is the government working for me, right? Or is this sort of a global elitist conspiracy and we're just kind of right, the fodder for this story. So if you look at that chart there on the left, right, you have a significant number of people who buy into some of the core claims of QAnon. 24% of US adults, right? So not an ins insignificant number of the population. That number shrinks a little bit for Democrats, grows a little bit for Republicans, um, but right as a whole, 24% of US adults think, yeah, some of these QAnon conspiracies right, are legitimate. And that could look like, for example, 16% of people thinking that, yeah, American, you know, native born whites are being replaced by immigrants, right? This is the great replacement conspiracy theory that's been gaining ground the last couple of years. Similarly, right, so, Paper from earlier this year found 60%. Uh, AP NOR survey from last year found 32%, specifically around that great replacement consideration theory. Right? Part of that being driven by right, the continual talking points on shows like Tucker Carlson and others, where the discourse of replacement connected to right, migration and immigration politics, particularly the Texas border, um, linked those two kind of ideas together. If I think about this for a second, 16% of the public agrees with one of these core QAnon ideas, right? That the government media and financial world in the US are controlled by a group of satanic worshiping pedophiles, right? Who also right, sacrifice children and drink their blood, right? The adrenochrome conspiracies, right? That fed into Pizzagate and other kind of examples, right? So 16% of Americans think that that's a realistic political reality, right? In this country today. and turn those beliefs right into political actions. And they also, right, 22%, so a slightly bigger group think right, a storm is coming that's gonna right, expose all of this political corruption, right? And that kind of narrative drove a lot of the people on January 6th that were hoping right, that there would be some secret behind the scenes move by former President Trump right, to impose martial law or to you know, actually show the real conspiracy 
hidden behind the deep state conspiracy, right, which would expose this whole cabal. But these political beliefs, we may laugh at them and say, really, there's like a satanic worshiping, child eating cabal operating out of the basement of pizza places in Washington, DC, and you know, the hits that beholden to the Democratic Party. Um, but these beliefs, right, have deeper political implications. So just this um, last year or two, we've seen right, growing efforts not only to right, control and gerrymander political districts to marginalize political voters, but also right, a return to the kind of voter suppression tactics that we saw in the Jim Crow era and even sort of in the prelude to the Jim Crow era, right? So armed groups out of poll sites, um, so example here, we had armed vigilantes monitoring, right? Their election monitors uh, monitoring the ballot drop boxes. This is particularly in Maricopa County, Arizona, where you had a, a very contested political election and very active militia groups, very active political conspiracy groups. Right? But this kind of a trend right, is likely to become more important as we move towards the 2024 presidential election. Right? We're likely to see more of this um, probably here in Ohio and other places, right? election monitoring groups, some of them potentially armed right out front of these political centers. Why does that matter? Well, part of the reason is that these are kind of the bubblings up on the surface of a deeper growing political shift in the United States of the acceptance of violence and seeing political violence as an acceptable way to get things done. And that movement on that autocracy scale, we looked at earlier from plus 10 to plus five over the last decade right, is a reflection of these deeper changing cultural and political politics. Right? More people having distrust in democratic institutions and more willing to break them when it seems politically convenient. Right? So we, 38% from a PRI survey earlier this year right, found that because things have gotten so far off track in this country, we need a leader who's willing to break some rules if that's what it takes to get things right. right? So that kind of support for an authoritarian strongman who will step in, right, and drain the swamp and fix the problems and make America great again, right? Or make Hungary great again, if you're Orbach. Right? Insert, right, political leader, Bolsonaro, Modi, right, whoever it might be in that political context, right? They're the person that will save that country. And importantly, right, 38%, that's not an insignificant number of people right, who are willing to say, well, we've tried this democracy thing. Maybe it's not working. Maybe we need someone who can play fast and loose with you know, democracy, if that means that they get the job done, right? Part of why this is important, right? 32% of the larger sort of US voters believe right, the 2020 election was stolen from President Trump. So it's a significant number of the US public, right? Who thinks that Right now, right, November 6th at 7.30 in the evening, we have an illegitimate fake president in the White House, right, who's going to be running again in the 2024 elections and may potentially try to steal a second election, right? That's already the narrative that's been circulating on social media, on places like Parler, Gab, 4chan, and other sites. Okay. And that number jumps to 63% when we look at just specifically Republican identifying voters within that block, right? So... 63% of Republicans think the election was stolen from Trump, 32% of the broader American public. Right? And so if you feel like the person in office isn't your real president, and you think that that matters, right, and you're more willing to engage in violence or support a strong man, right, that's what that movement from the plus 10 to the plus five, right, is trying to help us pay attention to right, these kind of trends. But it's not just right the partisan distrust, the feeling like maybe we can play fast and loose with democracy. But we're also seeing greater acceptance for political violence itself. Okay? So looking just from 2017 to 2020, in terms of the percentage of adults who think that violence is justified to advance right, some kind of political goal, right, we've seen a huge jump from less than 10% in 2017, right before kind of right in the aftermath of the 2016 election, all the way up to 36% in 2020, and that number is even higher today. Right? So we've gone from a population of you know, eight or 9% who thought political violence was acceptable to now right, over 30% of the population who thinks political violence is acceptable. And importantly, right, that's Democrats and Republicans vote. It's not just on the political right. right? So both Democrats and Republicans who think 
we may need to use political violence, right, to either keep our person in power or right, to keep someone else from getting into power. Right? We're starting to see these kind of conflicts on the streets more and more is that political opinion piece there highlights. And right, we're seeing this discourse about civil war pop up more in newspapers and all kinds of different places, right? So New Yorker up on the top left, Rand Research Policy Center, right? The London Guardian, Rolling Stone, Brookings Institute, Washington Post, right? All kinds of different sources, academic, NGOs, popular press, right? All talking about this discourse of is the United States moving towards a civil war, right? With many of them pointing to, right, both January 6th insurrection to growing um, sort of support for like, this kind of authoritarian politics that that uh, justified the use of violence, right, as part of that attacking our enemies. Yeah. And also, right, think about what would a new civil war look like, right? So in the kind of political media discursive space, right, we already have a very active narrative about a civil war, not just that it could happen, but what it might already look like. So we don't have to wonder, right? We're already being told what it could potentially look like when it happens, right? We're kind of being primed already in a sense to imagine that this is gonna be likely. The Time did a whole feature piece last November about right, the growing political violence in which they cataloged right, state after state after state after state after state examples of political violence. And, and as we see, right, these quotes are from that time piece, right, a huge surge in attacks on right, all the different parts of the political machineries, boards of elections, librarians, right, local boards of education, right, we've seen that here in Ohio with the last couple of years of political mm -hmm. debates over things like the teaching of critical race theory, LGBTQ politics, right, transgender students. 9,600 recorded threats against members of Congress, right, a jump tenfold from 2016. Right. Threats against federal judges have spiked 400% in the past six years and right, to more than 4,200 in 2021. Right. And what that looks like is, for example, this tweet from Ricky Schiffer, it wouldn't matter if we don't get violent. We see the courts are unfair and unconstitutional. All that's left is force. Right? August 8th, 2022, four days later, he attacks the FBI office in Cincinnati, a nail gun and an assault rifle. Couldn't get in. It's a police chase. Eventually, it landed in a cornfield. It's a shootout. Right? He's killed by the law enforcement officers. We're seeing these kind of narratives play out more and more. Right? So we have the legitimation, the discourse about political violence being acceptable, and that translates right into individual actors like this, putting that political vision right into practice. So extremist scholars would refer to this as right accelerationism, right? This kind of we want to bring on a civil war, right? We want to bring on the race war, right? Because that's the only way political change is going to happen. So actually embracing right, those calls for violence as positive, right, as necessary. So, right, getting back to kind of the main focus here, what do we think about the possibility of civil war? Right, well, 67% of respondents think that there's a serious threat to our democracy, but we're split on whether or not we think we're at that stage of civil war, right? Only about 5% really strongly agree that there's going to be a civil war in the next couple of years, right? And this is based on a survey from May and June of last year, 2022. 8.4% strongly agree, but 36% somewhat agree, right? So a not insignificant number of people either significant, somewhat, or very strongly, right, agree. But still, right, the majority of Americans, almost 50%, don't agree that, right, we're going to see a civil war in the next couple of years. So people may be worried, but not enough to think, right, that we're really on that kind of cusp of a civil war starting. And this is part of what scholars like Barbara Walter and others are talking about, which is, there's a perception in the United States that a civil war couldn't ever happen here again. Right? We're too strong of a democracy. We have too many checks and balances in place that, that couldn't happen. But when we look at the measures, the slide from democracy from 10 plus 10 to plus five, increasing role of factions, increasing role of religious, racial, ethnic identity, defining those political factions, those are precisely the things that scholars like Walter are pointing to and other places to say, look, this is what we have to watch because that's what means you're heading towards potential political instability, violence, and maybe even a civil war. Right? And she's saying, well, we need to 
take those rose colored glasses off because we're seeing those same tendencies, right? Those same trends um, here in the United States. Right, so this same uh, winter mute at all study from earlier, I think it was September of this year, right? Found that almost 20%, 18.9% agreed strongly or very strongly that having a strong leader for America is more important than having a democracy. Right, so 20%, almost one in five, right? Americans think democracy, eh, I'd rather have political stability, right? Give me law and order. 13.7 agreed that either strongly or very strongly, right? In the next few years, there's gonna be a civil war. And then finally, 32.8% considered violence to usually or always be justified to advance at least one of a number of different political goals. Okay, so we're seeing amongst the American public, a growing shift to say political violence is okay and maybe even necessary in, in a number of different situations. And we can see these, right, as kind of a, a rising trend. Right? So think about 2017, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, 2020 armed protests in Michigan, the operation in October where the FBI busted the Wolverine militias who were plotting to kidnap and potentially execute Governor Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. Right? This was a very elaborate, long planned out militia activity. Michigan also being the heart of militias in the United States. Right? January 2021, the Capitol insurrection. 2022, there was 18, at least that we know of, 18 reported attacks on power plants and substations. Right? A key part of any kind of insurgent practice, right, is targeting political figures and right, infrastructure, the power, the phone, electricity grids. And then just in the last two years, right, we've seen an uh, increasing surge, even above what we saw in 2022, uh, background checks for people purchasing guns, right, increasing efforts across many states to do more right, gerrymandering and voter suppression efforts, increasing anti-government rhetoric, right, and this is both coming from the left and the right, Right. A lot of people are skeptical about, is the Supreme Court really an independent judiciary anymore? Do we need to expand it? Do we need to put term limits, right? Those are coming from different sides of the political aisle, attacks on secretaries of state, right? Growing number of candidates who are willing to embrace the liberal politics, right? The kind of strongman politics. And a growing number of those figures that are actually getting involved in politics, right? The sort of House Freedom Caucus being one example, right? Where you've got figures who say, I'll go, I'll run, and I'll just shut the whole machine down if you don't agree to my certain political agenda, right? And it doesn't matter, I'll hold the entire rest of the country hostage if I don't get my way, right? And again, right, growing activity by these both right-wing extremist individuals and these kind of groups like Patriot Front, Proud Boys, and others, right? So if we think about what are the factions that are emerging today in the United States that could potentially trigger a future civil war, right? So the Polity Project, the same group that helps us do some of these measures about political instability, put out their regime narrative for the United States from 2020. And these are the two factions that they identified. So one big faction they called supporters of Donald Trump. And in that kind of category, they put the Republican Party, evangelical Christians, white nationalists, the rural population, local police groups, and Fox News. And so what could potentially trigger this faction to take up kind of armed violence? Right. Well, one possibility is Trump right, being kicked off of the ballots in 2024 in individual states or just his laws in general, right? Because that would feed into the stop the steal narrative from 2020, right? Not only did they steal one election, now they've stolen right, two elections. Potential future pandemic, right? We're not really done with COVID yet, but a new kind of another wave where the government tries to impose the same kind of lockdown measures we saw could lead to right, even more potential backlash. And right, another kind of social movement uprising of the kind we saw in the summer of 2020 with Black Lives Matter, right, that could also potentially lead to right, a pushback and a backlash as we saw in places like Portland, Oregon, and in other cities. The other kind of faction they identified is the sort of opposition, right, Democratic Party, Black Americans, professionals, urban populations, and mainstream media. Right? What are the things that might push the more kind of political left into a civil war? House refusing to certify Joe Biden, as the president in 2024, potentially, right? A nationwide federal abortion ban that included no exceptions for rape, incest, anything else, right? A very hard line kind of Christian conception starts at the moment you're having sex, boom, that's it. There's no exceptions, 
right? rolling back civil rights. We've already heard some of the Supreme Court justices question the precedence for interracial marriage, gay marriage, right? If those were to be rolled back as well, right? those could be a potential trigger for right, some kind of a larger uprising. Might not lead to a civil war, right? but those are certainly the kind of things we talk about. What's causing political instability? Right? What's leading to potential political violence? So that's what I'm seeing, looking through this literature, trying to think about, is the United States potentially moving toward the civil? Anybody has questions, please go ahead. So, if I remember right, I think we're currently a lot to see plus five, and that's from 2021. Mm -hmm. Are there any more recent data than that? I have not seen something for 2022 or 2023 yet, but it, based on the trend they've been looking at, it makes me suspect we may when they come out with a new report, be one more point down. I can't say for sure. Um, it's actually something that I was trying to find an answer to and I wasn't able to, but it's, um, it's something that um, I know people are working on. Yes. This is kind of a new show, but on your chart with where civil wars are going on, there was a dot in Mexico. What's going on there? Uh, I think it's connected to the drug cartels, particularly in the Northern uh, part of Mexico. Yeah, areas. Um, Sinaloa and kind of north up to the border where you've got effectively no government um, operation um, or a government operation constantly under sort of armed uh, threat, let's say, yeah. And just uh, for folks who are interested in that Center for Foreign Relations map, all of those dots are kind of clickable. It pops up more information about um, what kind of measures are looking at in each of those cases. If folks want to dig into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I know you didn't mention the existence of charismatic leader uh, or an head of a faction, a radicalized faction. And you didn't mention um, financial crisis or economic pressure trigger. So, so interestingly, the scholars would say both of those um, are part of the kind of 38 potential factors that scholars are looking at when they think about triggers for civil war. Um, but actually, a lot of the literature thought that the kind of economic question, particularly um, growing economic um, disparities within a society, a lot of people said that's kind of a key trigger for civil wars. Um, but when the CIA analysts and the civil war experts put all their data together, the model said, actually, the economic um, inequality, the economic disparity isn't a kind of key predictor of a potential civil war, which actually surprised a lot of the experts because that had been kind of a common assumption that it's the economic uh, kind of instability or right? your uh, currency being devalued, um, wages dropping, rising inflation, deflation, stagflation, depending on the context, right? That, that's part of what tears a country apart. Um, and they would say, yes, it's an important factor, but it's not a predictive factor, at least from what they've seen um, for the kind of political instability and potential for violence. Um, but I think they would say from the, the factional perspective that that's kind of a key part of bringing people into those factions, right? That charismatic sort of figure, um, particularly if that charismatic figure um, is building a political identity rooted in a racial or ethnic or religious uh, kind of politics, right? Identity politics. Um, just curious if, if you have a look at this, uh, of course I'm not arguing by any means that the cost of anything, but you would be curious to know if they, what the role of social media have been in, in generating political polarization, which is a lot of other things that you're showing. So to get us into that direction, so I'm just curious. Yeah, so I didn't talk about it as much here, but definitely folks are looking at kind of communication media studies. Um, the kind of main vector for a lot of those sort of QAnon conspiratorial politics to circulate is specifically through social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, not as much on TikTok, but it's becoming kind of another vector. And those play out um, as you go. So the connection between social media and conservative uh, media consumption. So for example, someone who only watches uh, Fox News or only watches Newsmax or only watches ONA and is on social media, the likelihood of political polarization and conspiratorial politics goes up pretty significantly. I don't know the exact kind of 
numbers, but some of the stuff I've looked at, like there's a pretty direct correlation between the kind of media ecosphere you're in and the way kind of partisan politics grow. Yeah, so the social media is definitely kind of a key, um, you know, it's a kind of network connectivity, um, right, discursive place. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Do you think, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've seen any analysis of this or just your personal thoughts, if, if we would even be discussing this if Trump hadn't won, won the Republican nomination in 2016? I mean, you know, if it had been Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz, would we still be discussing this topic? My suspicion is we probably would. The discourse might look a little bit different, but for example, if we think about the uh, discourse around, for example, the great replacement the conspiracy theory. Right? Part of that has actually been driven by both the changing demographics in the United States as reflected in the updated American community surveys and kind of demographic census data and right, increasing number of migrants, particularly from sort of Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and then further South that are fleeing both um, political and economic insecurity, but also at climate change, right? Increasing number of climate migrants. So I think those kind of dynamics, it wouldn't matter who was in office, Republican, Democrat, or independent, those are still kind of important political drivers that people are seeing maybe in the news, maybe they're seeing them in their local workplace. They're certainly being talked about in kind of the social context to say, uh, our country's changing in ways that I'm not happy with and I want someone that can speak to those kind of changes. Right? In the same way that the Tea Party did kind of in an earlier period right before Trump became a political actor in the scene. So I think some of those kind of deeper political trends um, would still be pushing at least some of this, whether it would look quite the same as it does now. I feel like it's hard to say Trump has played a uniquely polarizing and charismatic role, you know, Neil was asking about in that moment, um, but it's hard to say if a different political leader, right, uh, a Ron DeSantis or someone else could have moved in and kind of played a similar sort of polarizing role. That I'd have to put on my sort of political speculation hat. I'm not sure, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. So one of the things that um, I've noticed, um, like with the strategy of the Republican Party, um, in like my study, the Republican Party seems to be going after the Latino vote a little more, like appealing to the um, like conservative talking points. Um, and whereas before, um, like on, um, like on the TV channels and stuff, you would see mostly commercials from Democrats talking about like immigration reform. Um, so I think there is a sense of like, um, like being, being disillusioned, being disappointed in, um, in the fact that the, um, that the Democrats never really delivered anything significant or permanent with immigration reforms. So how do you see like the uh, how do you see the Latino uh, Latino vote playing into uh, this whole phenomenon? I think I have two kind of different thoughts, I guess. One is I think you're seeing, um, and I think this becomes more true of sort of second and third generation migrants, particularly if they have a connection to Mexico, becoming uh, more polarized, partly around partisan identity, but also around religious identity, so particularly Catholicism and sort of the split and the more kind of liberal Catholic and more conservative Catholic politics, particularly around abortion right now. Um, but also I think to a broader degree, kind of, um, you know, queer politics in general, whether it's LGBTQ rights, transgender politics, or even the kind of stuff in schools. I think that's actually a kind of a, a grassroots community level is sort of pulling some of the kind of broader Latino community in two different political directions, those more kind of conservative leaning and those more political leaning. And I think the both the Republicans and the Democrats are trying to kind of drive that wedge in deeper and speak to right maybe the more socially conservative and religiously conservative um, electoral voters within the broader Latino community and say, hey, we're you know the Democratic Party has left you behind, like you were saying, we're kind of the future right of this party. And then the same thing on the Democratic side, right, saying right, we're trying to get immigration reform, right, we're trying to do like all these different changes that would both create a more humane border policy, migration, asylum policies, um, but we can't get all this, any of this done because of this, you know, continual blocking of partisan politics by the Republicans. So it, come over to this side and support this more kind of political liberal agenda. So I think that's definitely happening. But I think the other um, kind of shift is that 
We're seeing an increasing number of young um, Latino migrants coming in, many of them right who are, are undocumented and don't have a political voice in the formal political system, but are still very actively engaged in kind of broader politics. And I think that is kind of a, a moving piece, and I'm not clear where that goes because they're an important political block, but they don't have an electoral vote in the same way that you know, citizens or naturalized citizens do. And I don't know where that shapes the political discourse because they're an important political force, but they can't show up in the polls in the same way that those who have been either naturalized or you know, grew up here second, third, fourth generation. So just kind of off the top of my head, those are a couple of reactions. And like the other thing that um, the other thing that I see there is like the social class, um, like the intersection of um, social class, also in like the um, in the types of political violence that is um, one of the things that um, that happened in my hometown. Um, I live in a small rural town. Was that um, like they had like these special interest groups like looking at every single person who registered to vote. Um, and there were a few um, like homeless people or transient people who had um, who had, who had registered like a PO box at the, um, and although it's a technicality, um, in, um, in Wisconsin, you can't register a PO box and the person who registered them didn't say anything. So then they were charged with a, uh, with a felony. And when people have, uh, when they're in very despondent economic situations, um, I think that that's a form of like um, indirect uh, political violence. Um, and um, so that's um, that's another, um, you know, like the political harassment or, or violence to, that follows like social process. Yeah, I think we're seeing this in right, Louisiana and some of the Southern states with you know, attempts to redraw electoral districts to, you know, draw out black uh, sort of voting power or dilute it by spreading it out across different electoral districts. I don't think we're at the point yet where that would become the issue that would cause people more on the kind of political left or progressive spectrum to rise up. But it's certainly, if you listen to kind of discourse about election politics more broadly, whether it's the think tanks or the scholars, that, that's a point people are increasingly pointing to that we're getting to a point where it may not matter what your political preferences are if a, the local level and state level politics are controlled by Republicans, if the Secretary of State is controlled by Republicans, if the governor is a Republican, if the state Supreme Court is controlled by Republicans, then right, there's a fear that they can do whatever they want because there's no longer the check and balance is there, but effectively it only operates for one political party, right? So. And that's one of those examples where you're still in that democratic range, but a lot of people would say, hmm, this isn't really what we mean by democracy, right? Even though on the surface, it is still democracy. Any other questions? I have questions, but I think I'll leave them for my private conversation with Chris. I have one from the audience. Okay. How many of you think that the possibility of a civil war happening in the U.S. is actually real? And how many of you think it's something to worry about, but still kind of not that serious? Should we do this as a secret ballot? Or... <laughs> <laughs> actually need to sign it? <laughs> Wait, is it called? All right. Yeah. Need to do a, a menti poll. But yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely real. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'd want to ask, I mean, this isn't to disrespect what you just shared over the past hour, but when you say the U.S. is headed for civil war, I'm still not clear what that means, right? You alluded to the fact that 61 to 65, we're not going to see that again. Uh, clearly, we're admired in polarization. That was portrayed, portrayed very compelling in your talk. Um, I, I think I would say no, but surely we're in the midst of incredibly politically frustrating times. I mean, I don't, I don't think I would raise my hand to answer the affirmative. So interestingly, so both um, Barbara Water and her book and uh, Marchant and the others and all their books, each of them has at least one chapter where they kind of map out what a potential civil war would look like, kind of the inciting events. And almost all of them, it's 
usually a series of small targeted uh, political assassinations, bombings, and sort of um, taking over of political spaces. It could be a uh, state house. It could be um, a kind of political government building. It could be taking out a key um, bridge that connects different parts of the state or a key interstate. Um, and but importantly, doing it in a coordinated way. So you know, over the course of two or three days, you have. 10 or 12 political leaders, governors, congressional officers who are assassinated. You have multiple bombs that go off inside um, legislative buildings, inside uh, voter election buildings, inside public spaces. And the hope is that right, that will then spark more kind of copycat actions will then spiral out of control. And then uh, part of a state becomes ungovernable, forcing the US military to come in, which then provokes another response in a different part of the country. So a lot of the scenarios are sort of something along those lines. Yeah, sounds like the 1960s. <laughs> I mean, it's it's basically, it's the Turner Diaries, right? That kind of theory for those folks that are familiar with the kind of right-wing uh, narrative of race war in the United States, right? It's uh, targeted armed political assassinations or being coordinated by underground cells, loosely connected, um, but without any overarching hierarchical structure, you can't cut a head off because they're all independently operating cells, right? In the same way that Al Qaeda and ISIS and others have organized their infrastructure. I mean, I was just going to get at, like, I mean, I think one thing that makes the 1861 to 1865 scenario unlikely also is it's not regionally, yeah. you know, located, right? I mean, it's the, it's, you know, they're, they're quote unquote the blue states, but then there are red rural areas in all of those blue states, and all of the red states have blue cities, right? That, that makes it, you know, it's hard to imagine that you could just sort of draw a line halfway. Like you remember the yeah. famous map in 2004, the, the Jesus land yeah. map after the 2004 election. Like that, that, that doesn't seem likely in that in a sense. Yeah, and some of the political geographers, you know, have suggested that there's maybe anywhere from three to seven kind of imagined nations that the U.S. were to fraction in different ways and they've kind of mapped out the different identities of this region. But um, only a few of them vaguely map over, you know, the secession of South um, and not in a clear way that we could say, oh, yeah, we're going to see another, you know, Confederacy rise. Uh, even I would say that that seems um, too unlikely to worry about as a political reality, at least now. Who knows about the future? But yeah. And just really briefly, because I know we're pressed for time. I mean, one thing that your talk didn't broach was that um, agree or disagree, the legal system is working, right? I mean, agree or disagree, the former president has been brought up on four indictments and 92 counts, and the legal system is trying to work. Um, in terms of an institution, does that pre present kind of a lifeboat of some kind, or does that just in general more frustration and distrust, or? I think it does both. I would say it, it's a, a lifeboat or kind of a safety stopgap at the moment. Um, but two of the worries that a lot of scholars looking at this would point to is one, um, we're increasingly seeing um, kind of illiberal political figures. So for example, um, individuals running for secretaries of state who would oversee state elections who think the 2020 election was stolen and could potentially be in the place to refuse to certify a slate of electors from that state and then send them to DC. So that's one worry that you could have a person who gets into the position of power at the state level who can then distort those mechanisms because there's no check on their ability to do that. Um, the other one, and I'm forgetting his name right now, he just wrote a book that came out this year about the shadow docket of the Supreme Court. Um, and he and other constitutional scholars have argued that we're starting to see a lot of important and worrying uh, legal precedents coming out of the Supreme Court in the kind of shadow docket where there's really no justification, there's no explanation, but then those start to become used as precedent by district and lower courts, which then make their way back up to the Supreme Court, which then rules on those kind of unstated precedents and it's creating this sort of feedback loop where the public doesn't know the basis that justices are ruling on important precedents that then make their way down to the lower courts and then when those questions come back up to the Supreme Court, they kind of point to the own unstated precedents that work their way back up to them to say, well, this is now kind of the law of the land and there's no way to challenge that because they are the kind of highest authority. So there's some worry too that the mechanisms within the institutional process of the judiciary 
could actually warp themselves in dangerous ways that um, we perhaps haven't really thought about because it's never emerged as a, a legal constitutional issue in that way. I mean, even an example of could Trump be disqualified from being able to run for president from one of these many lawsuits, right? We don't know because we don't have any prior um, precedent to point that to. I think there's some other things that people would point to as well that are potentially worrying, um, but you know that would get into a longer kind of political discussion. But those are two that I've seen a lot of scholars point to that are the system working, um, but still potentially throwing things off the rails in unintended ways. That's an important question. Any research on maybe countries that are on trajectory right de decreasing in anocracy, you know, moving away from democracy yeah. of reverses or remedies or you know, some change of course and going back the other way. Yeah, definitely. So you know, part of it is. Um, changing laws that, for example, make uh, stronger checks and balances between different branches of government, particularly so taking power away from a strong kind of um, you know, executive figure who has kind of unchecked power. So putting in some kind of checks or guards on that um, can be one kind of key way where countries start to move a little bit um, further away from the minus 10 autocracy to the kind of plus 10 democracy. Um, stronger independent judiciaries is another one. Okay, so we've seen playing out kind of in the reverse right now in Israel with debates about the Supreme Court and their political independence there. And so you can imagine in any country where that debate, it could move it one way or it could move it the other, depending on you know, the Knesset in the Israeli case or whatever the kind of you know legislative body is, puts in some kind of additional guardrails on the legislative, on the executive, on the judicial. Those kind of measures can be important. I think also if you see the political parties moving away from the kind of ideologies and more to, or sorry, away from the kind of ethnic, racial, religious identities and more to what we think of traditional kind of party politics, you know, conservative economic policies or liberal social policies, then the factionalism becomes less about my core existential identity and becomes more a debate about what's the best policies for a country. And those kind of things can help kind of de-factionalize and as not necessarily de-radicalize, but promote some potential more stability. And I know there's a lot of other suggestions in the literature um, that aren't coming to mind in the moment, but the scholars would also point to, to kind of what can you do to help sort of build more trust in democratic institutions and move them like closer, stronger free press, better civic education, um, you know, more sort of discourse across political groups. Um, any, anything that Come across the discuss the electoral college and how what potential point of vulnerability states in terms of maintaining the legitimacy of the political system. Yeah, so that would be another one along with like the shadow dockets of the Supreme Court and the potential abuses of uh, Supreme or uh, secretaries of state mm -hmm. or electoral certification. And a lot of people also suggest, right, that the electoral college is another one of those places where um, that we know historically why it was created to kind of balance state power and ensure southern slaveholder representation diluted, as well as the kind of you know uh, political elites distrust of the unwashed masses and their you know rabid democratic tendencies. Right, you have to keep the real democracy from getting in power. Um, but I think that legacy of those political decisions then are still with us today, and a lot of people say, well a way to strengthen some of those democratic safeguards is right, to get rid of the electoral college and just have the popular vote so that there's not some mediating factor that can distort right, the popular opinion. Um, and that itself is both an interesting debate within different fields, but also I think amongst the public, right? Some people think we should abolish it. Some people think we should reform it. Some people think it's just fine and we don't need to mess with it. Right? Um, so I think that's also kind of one of those debates about institutional places where things could be changed for the good or for worse, depending on your kind of political intentions. Well, thank you everybody for coming.